usually my voice carries, uh, particularly in a microphone. But if you can't hear me, just, just raise your hand and I'll try to elevate my voice a little bit. Uh, so as Judy mentioned, my name is Dr. James Galvin. I run the Comprehensive Center for Brain Health and the Louis Body Dementia Research Center of Excellence. And I'm gonna spend the next six or seven hours with you talking about Parkinson's disease dementia. Um, and, and so Parkinson's disease dementia is one of two Lewy body dementias. So Lewy body dementia is a broad umbrella term that includes two disorders, uh, Parkinson's disease dementia. And so for that, you have to have Parkinson's disease first and then the dementia later. And the other disorder that's very similar is dementia with Lewy bodies, which is basically any other presentation. Um, and the Lewy bodies dementias together make up a very common cause of cognitive impairment in the older adult. And in fact, it's probably the most common disease most people have not heard of. Um, the incidence rate of these diseases is about one and a half people per thousand person years, make up about 7% of all dementia cases. Um, now, the most common cause of dementia is sort of dementia not otherwise specified, right? So that's not pathologically, but that's how it's made diagnoses. And so if you look at all the people who are diagnosed with dementia, many of them are not actually diagnosed with anything. They're diagnosed with dementia. Um, so that's the most common cause. But then when you take away all those, uh, it's Alzheimer's disease and then the Lewy body dementias, which is dementia with Lewy bodies and Parkinson's dementia, and then the vascular dementias. And they make up most of the cases. Uh, what we do know, um, and again, was brought up in a question before, is about 75 to 80% of patients with Parkinson's disease who live 10 years or longer with their disease are likely to develop dementia. And in reality, if everybody could live infinitely, essentially everybody with Parkinson's disease would develop a dementia. Um, and that's due to their Parkinson's disease changes. It's not necessarily due to other pathology changes in their brain, okay? Um, men more commonly have Parkinson's disease than women, and men more commonly have the Lewy body dementias compared to women. It's about 1.6 to one. So a little over a half a man for every additional for every compared to every woman. The combined total of people with these disorders is about 1.4 million people in the United States. Now, I never like comparing one disease to another, but just to give you some sense of the scope of this, right? Uh, Alzheimer's, we think there's about 6.2 million people who have Alzheimer's disease. The Lewy body dementias, which include Parkinson's disease dementia and dementia with Lewy bodies, about 1.4 million. Now, if you look at some of these other diseases, which people are much more familiar with, in, in the United States, there's about a million people with multiple sclerosis. There are about 800,000 strokes per year. Um, brain tumors, all brain tumors, make up about 700,000. Muscular dystrophy, if you remember the old Jerry Lewis telethons for muscular dystrophy, that's about 250,000 people. Uh, Huntington's disease, about 30,000. And ALS, Lou Gehrig's disease, is only about 12,000 people. Now, these are all terrible diseases. Again, I am not comparing one disease to another. I'm just talking about what people tend to know about these different diseases. And I would say in the second column, many people are familiar with those diseases, but they're not so familiar with Parkinson's disease, dementia, and Lewy body dementias. So to answer the question that came before, all people with Parkinson's disease by definition have Lewy bodies. Lewy bodies are the pathology of Parkinson's disease, just like senile plaques is the pathology of Alzheimer's disease, okay? Um, so these are the criteria back in 1992 when they were published for Parkinson's disease. And they've been updated a little bit, but I like showing the original, you know, United Kingdom brain back criteria Could it, for, for my talk. And again, I'm a cognitive neurologist. I'm not a movement disorder doctor. So I work with the movement disorder doctors to help co-manage these patients. And I'm really gonna focus on the cognitive side, the memory and thinking and behavioral side of today, okay? So if you can see in the criteria for Parkinson's disease, um, under step two, what excludes Parkinson's disease, I highlighted and bolded early dementia, right? And I'll, I'll get into that in a second, but that was one thing is like, well, Parkinson's disease doesn't have cognitive problems. Of course, now we know that almost everybody at the time of their diagnosis of Parkinson's disease have some changes in their cognition compared to the way they used to be. It may not be sufficient to call it dementia, but there are some changes. 
And I just want to show you sort of the evolution of our thinking. So James Parkinson wrote the essay on the shaking palsy in 1817. The essay on the shaking palsy include description of five people of which James Parkinson only examined two of them. The other three people he observed walking down the street, right? So my former chair of neurology used to call this bus stop neurology, right? You go to a bus stop, you can meet many, many interesting people, right? Maybe not in New York, maybe not in Florida so much because not many people take buses, but in cities where there's a lot of public transportation, a lot of interesting people ride buses and subways. Um, and so James Parkinson described these people and what he wrote in 1817 is that the senses and intellect are unaffected. It wasn't until 1888 that Charcot, a very famous psychiatrist, um, who described a lot of the changes that were associated with syphilis, um, found in Parkinson patients that he saw changes in personality and cognition. So as a history buff, there's lots of classic textbooks. And so this classic test, textbook on, the, on neurology written by Lord Brain. Yes, neurologists have had some strange names in the past. So there was a neurologist with the last name of Brain. And there was another neurologist with the last name of Head. So, um, but for this one, Lord Brain wrote that Parkinson is not necessarily accompanied by any neurologic mental changes um, or that uh, affect the intellectual capacity. Rather, they're unimpaired and it's just that their masked faces is hiding it, okay? So we know a lot more now than we used to. So uh, many investigators have gotten together and written about Parkinson's disease, dementia. This is sort of the original consensus criteria uh, in the early 2000s that we have to have the established Parkinson's disease and then you develop a cognitive disorder, right? So some criteria write a two-year window, some write a one-year window. There's always arguments back and forth between the cognitive people and the movement people as to whether it's a one-year window, a two-year window, or if there really is no window at all, okay? But for the purpose of these criteria, it's about two years after the start of Parkinson's disease, you can start to see some changes in cognition that are sufficiently there to interfere with someone's ability to independently function. And that's the definition of dementia is a change in memory and thinking that interferes with someone's everyday activities, okay? Um, so it has to represent a decline from what they used to be able to do, and it has to impair their everyday life, okay? More recently, there's been another construct that's been described and what we call mild cognitive impairment, okay? Now, this has been described in the Alzheimer world for many, many years. But there was a question as to whether there really was a clear sort of transition state in Parkinson's disease between motor Parkinson's and Parkinson's dementia. And the more we studied it, the more we realized there in fact is this transition stage, this mild cognitive impairment people. Um, and so in fact, uh, about 25 to, to you know, percent or so of people who are non-demented will go on to develop PDMCI. Um, and in fact, I said before, cognitive deficits can often be found if you look for them in patients when they're first diagnosed with their motor Parkinson's. They may not have any problems with their memory, but they have problems in other domains, particularly in attention and in what we call executive function. That's their ability to sort of problem solve, make decisions, think things through in the same way that they used to be able to. Um, so in Alzheimer's disease, amnestic MCI, that is the MCI where memory is significantly impaired is the most common presentation, but non-amnestic, non-memory causes of MCI are really the earliest presentation in most cases of Parkinson's disease MCI. So in the middle here, we have a picture of a Lewy body. So this is what Dr. Lewy described in the early 1900s. Um, and so I have an arrow pointing to the Lewy body. And so it has a dense core and like a little halo around it. Um, and this is in a dopaminergic neuron in the substantia nigra. So all of this is a little uh, pigment that we see in those neurons. Um, and so this is the classic picture of a Lewy body in Parkinson's disease. Again, by definition, all patients with Parkinson's disease have Lewy bodies. This is a Lewy body in a cortical neuron, so in the gray matter of the brain. 
And it looks very different. And in fact, this wasn't described until 1961 by Dr. Okasaki. Okay. Um, now, this is in a classic neuropathologic stain called hematoxylin and eosin. So they're just stains. That's why you kind of see different shades of pink and a little bit of blue. But we're much better now. We have better tools. So now we do antibodies against alpha synuclein, which is the building block of a Lewy body, or a ubiquitin, which is a protein that coats abnormal proteins. And we can see Lewy bodies much better. So we're much better at making these diagnoses pathologically after people die. Okay. We still can't see these things in living people. There's no way to see a Lewy body in a living person. Not yet. We're getting close, but not yet. Now, when people ask me, well, what are the symptoms and signs of Parkinson's disease dementia? Well, the first thing is they have to have motor Parkinson's disease. That's a requirement in order to have PDD. They have to have PD first. So they have the slowness, the stiffness, the imbalance in falls. They can have a tremor. They tend to shuffle when they walk. Um, but they also can have a collection of cognitive symptoms. So, and if you notice some of the words that are appearing in that cognitive box, right? They have trouble in visual tracking, in visual attention, in visual perception, right? So they have lots of visual spatial abnormalities. And sometimes, in fact, it's not the neurologist that sees these patients first, it's the ophthalmologist. Because they keep saying, well, my glasses aren't working and I can't see like I used to. And the ophthalmologist will try to fix their lenses the first time. And then they come back and say, doc, these glasses aren't working. And they say, ah, go see the neurologist because it's not your eyes, it's your brain, okay? Um, anything that's speeded. So if we're timing people, they tend to break down. They go very slow and they perform abnormally for a timed task. If you take away the time, so you give a similar task that's not timed, they actually do pretty well. But if you, once you throw time in there, because they're motor, motorly they're slow and thinking wise they're slow, they slow down. It can have a whole host of behavioral symptoms. The most common being what visual hallucinations, seeing things that aren't there. And for Lewy body diseases, it tends to be of little funny looking people or furry animals, by far the most common things that people will describe. Um, they can have hallucinations in other domains, though. They can hear things. They can smell things. They can taste things. They can feel things that aren't actually there. But visual is going to be the most common form. They can have a delusion. A delusion is a false belief. Okay? So people with Alzheimer's disease have hallucinations that tend to have more of a paranoid or suspicious quality to them. Hallucinations in Lewy body disorders tend to be more sort of misidentification. So looking at something and thinking it's something entirely else. And in Lewy body diseases in particular, the most common one is something called Capgras syndrome. So Capgras is sort of invasion of the body snatchers so that the person looks at someone and says, you look like you, but you're not really you. You've been replaced by someone who looks just like you. And often that's the caregiver that is the focus of that delusion. And that could be really disturbing to both the patient and to the caregiver. Uh, lots of mood changes, so they can have depression, anxiety, apathy, the loss of interest in things. Um, they can have REM sleep behavior disorder, so acting out one's dreams. And this can begin two or three decades before any other symptoms. Okay? And then they can have something called cognitive fluctuations. So these are spontaneous changes in alertness and attention. So people tend to stare blankly into space. They look drowsy or sleepy, even though they were... Oh, you know, they slept the night before. Their train of thought can be illogical. And again, it could snap on and off, almost like a faulty light switch. And then here's the really interesting thing, because Lewy bodies are not just found in the brain. They're really found throughout the body in any nervous system tissue. So patients may have lots of these what we call constitutional symptoms. And these can be just drive patients batty. And they can begin years before. And they're so nonspecific that people can't figure out really what's going on. It's hard to put it all together, right? You need a good detective, okay? Um, and so loss of smell, Lewy bodies in the olfactory bulbs, okay? The, 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 the sensing neurons that hang down in the top of the nose, okay? They can have constipation. Lewy bodies are in the wall of the colon. They can have urinary incontinence. Lewy bodies in the wall of the bladder, okay? 
They can have drooling, Lewy bodies in the salivary glands, runny nose, Lewy bodies in the sebaceous glands. Okay, they can have dizziness and lightheadedness, Lewy bodies found in the wall of the heart. Okay, so they can have lots and lots of changes in their blood pressure. They can have abnormal sweating, Lewy bodies depositing in the sweat glands. Okay, and they have sexual dysfunction. Okay, so lots of symptoms that may begin years before anything else. It's very hard to put it together, right? Now, I made it real easy because I put them all right on one slide for you, right? But if you've ever heard the story of, you know, three blind men and they're all feeling an elephant and they're all reaching at different parts of the elephant, they're going to describe different things. And so depending on which doctor you go to see these complaints about, it's going to take a while to kind of put all the pieces together. Now, as a cognitive neurologist, one of the things we do are lots of pencil and paper tests. Actually, we're doing a lot of them on computers now, but I still call it pencil and paper test, right? And so this allows us to tap into different domains. And the reason we do all these tests is not to drive you nuts, right? The reason we do all the tests is because each of the brain disorders performs differently on the different tests, okay? So in Alzheimer's disease, people can't learn. So information never gets in. So when you test their memory, their memory's poor. And no matter what you do, you can't help them get better with their memory on these tests. Whereas in Parkinson's disease, the message gets in there. Parkinson patients can learn, but they have trouble retrieving the information. So it gets in there, it's just hard for them to get it back out. Okay, so initially they may look like they have the same memory problem as Alzheimer's disease. But if I use cues, give them clues, the Parkinson patients can normalize their memory scores, whereas the Alzheimer patient cannot. Okay, so again, the reason we do all these tests is because it helps us make diagnoses. Now, interestingly, if you look back over time, so if we look at people when they're normal, they have, don't have Parkinson's disease and then develop Parkinson's disease and then go on to develop Parkinson's disease dementia, the changes in their cognitive abilities differs over time. So what we have found is that changes in things like working memory and visual spatial skills and executive function, that's that kind of planning out, problem solving, decision making, carrying out activities, uh, having mental flexibility so to be able to switch back and forth between tasks, multitasking, are some of the earliest things to change, okay? Whereas memory and language, the things that change very early in Alzheimer's disease, change much later in Parkinson's disease dementia. So if you use a memory test, people might actually have dementia for several years before they perform poorly on a memory test, right? So if you use the wrong test, you're going to have trouble making the right diagnosis. So the reason this is that there are some models trying to understand how the disease begins, right? And so remember I said that Parkinson's disease and Parkinson's disease dementia and dementia with Lewy bodies are both Lewy body disorders. So they share a common pathology, the Lewy body, those pictures I showed you before. But how the disease begins in a person may be very, very different. So in Parkinson's disease, we think the disease is really a bottom-up disease, right? So it starts outside the central nervous system in the enteric nervous system. That's the nerves that go to the wall of the gut and the bladder and uh, the sweat glands and those types of things. So that's why many people have constipation for decades before they get diagnosed with Parkinson's disease. And then it spreads up and it starts to affect the dopaminergic neurons in the, in the brain stem. And so then start to have the motor symptoms of Parkinson's disease and the REM sleep disorder. And then it continues to spread up to cover the gray matter of the brain. And that's when they develop the dementia. For dementia with Lewy bodies, it starts the other direction. So it seems to start more in the gray matter. And then it seems to go down so that many people with DLB will have Parkinson features, but they never have as severe Parkinson's features as people with Parkinson's disease. Okay, so one's a bottom up and one's a top down. They're both Lewy body diseases, but they can have two very different presentations. Now, this is a picture and you might've seen pictures like this, but I'm gonna do it in the context of a cognitive disorder, not a movement disorder, okay? 
So if I look at Parkinson's disease, Alzheimer's disease, and a healthy control, this is the substantia nigra. So this little dark line here, this is the seat of your dopamine neurons. This degenerates in Parkinson's disease, but it looks pretty healthy in Alzheimer's disease. Here's a healthy control, looks pretty good. But you can see in Parkinson's dementia, there's a loss of those neurons. Okay. On the other hand, the hippocampus, which is the little seahorse shaped structure here. So you can imagine your eyes, mind's eye, the little seahorse here. Um, this is your seat of your short term memory. Look at the hippocampus in Alzheimer's disease, it's really small. But here in Parkinson's dementia and in healthy controls, it looks pretty good. Again, so the reason that Parkinson's dementia patients can learn is because that primary structure is preserved until much later in the course of the disease, right? If you go to the end stage of any neurodegenerative disease, the brain looks the same and the patient looks the same, okay? Because there's so many changes in the brain, but we're talking about trying to make the diagnosis correctly. And then we can use imaging studies. So in the same way, this is an MRI and this, that hippocampus right here, this is the MRI of the hippocampus right here. And you can see it's very small in Alzheimer's disease, but it looks pretty good in Parkinson's disease, it looks healthier. So we can use the MRI to help us make a diagnosis. It doesn't exclude anything, it doesn't include anything, it's a tool we use to assist us in making a diagnosis. We can also do something called a DAT scan. This is a dopamine transporter scan, nuclear medicine scan. Right? And so all that dopamine that starts out in the substantia nigra, almost all of it winds up right here in the basal ganglia. Okay? Now you don't have to know anything about anatomy, you just have to know your punctuation marks. Okay? So a normal person, it looks like a comma, and in a person with Parkinson's disease, it looks like a period. Right? So if I see a comma, looks normal to me. If I see a period, it's abnormal. In this case, it's symmetric, but usually it's not, it's usually asymmetric presentation. This really nice paper that just came out this year is sort of a review, a meta-analysis, looking at all of the different imaging studies and imaging modalities that have looked at Parkinson's disease, Parkinson's MCI, and PDD, okay? And all the little dots that appear there are all the different areas that are different between healthy controls and Parkinson's disease, Parkinson's disease and Parkinson's MCI, Parkinson's MCI and Parkinson's dementia, right? So we're learning so much about how the brain changes and the order in which it changes, right? And this is really gonna foster a lot of research because if you can understand where things begin and how they begin, then you can design therapies to try to stop them, prevent them, and maybe, maybe reverse them. The reverse part's hard, okay? Something really interesting is something that's done more commonly in Japan than the United States, and that's cardiac imaging. So this is an MIBG scintigraphy, okay? It's a nuclear medicine scan of the heart. Now, your heart gets lots of nerves delivered to it, okay? And these nerves use dopamine to communicate with the heart muscle cells, okay? Um, and so this is a picture of the liver. These are the lungs. And here's the cardiac shadow. And this is, you can't really see it because it's for some reason, this thing doesn't wanna go away. Um, but if it didn't go away, then if it did go away, you could see this is a healthy control. This is a person with Alzheimer's. This is a healthy control. And this is a person with Parkinson's disease in the middle. And you can see they're like the scarecrow. They don't have a heart. They do have a heart. It's actually there, but because they have a dopamine loss, you can't see the imaging there, okay? Um, and so this is very specific for Lewy body disorders. So we see it in Parkinson's disease and Parkinson's dementia and dementia with Lewy bodies and pure autonomic failure and multiple systems atrophy. All diseases that are synucleinopathies, diseases with Lewy bodies, but you don't see this pattern in healthy controls, in Alzheimer's disease, in vascular dementia, in progressive supranuclear palsy, you don't see these changes, okay? But here's the, here's the reason we don't do it a lot in the United States. Same thing happens in type two diabetes. And so type two diabetes is such a high prevalence in the US population that this imaging would be very not helpful. 
So we have to find other ways of doing this. So one of the real interesting things with ways we're doing this is looking at spinal fluid, okay? So spinal fluid bathes the brain, right? And so everything that's happening in the brain, those proteins float around in the spinal fluid. And so now there's a test called real-time quaking-induced conversion or RT-quick, right? So we can take spinal fluid and we give it like a little seed and we see if it hyper aggregates. So it makes little synuclein aggregates. And we can measure that with a special machine to measure the curve of aggregation, right? And so a very, very, very sensitive technique to pick up synuclein, abnormal synuclein. <clears throat> now, what we can't do with this is get a good quantification, right? So I can tell you it's very abnormal, but I can't tell you how abnormal it is. So for right now, it's not a very good target for a therapy, right? Because I don't know how much a medicine is gonna change this, okay? But we're getting there. The, the assays are getting better and better as we talk. Another exciting thing is we can do some of this through skin biopsies. Remember, I said Lewy bodies are found in all nervous tissue. So the nerves that are in your skin, we can take a piece of that skin and look under a microscope and we can see um, the Lewy bodies inside, whoops, sorry, the Lewy bodies inside the skin biopsy. And then the green marks out the nerve. And so when we overlay it, you can see the Lewy bodies are inside the nerves, okay? So another uh, tool that we're developing. And then one of the things my lab is working on trying to develop blood test, right? So working with companies to see if we can measure these same abnormal proteins in blood, because blood is much easier to do than spinal taps, right? Um, and so this is a company that's in Taiwan that we're working with, and they have a way of measuring synuclein in the blood. And you can see that, oops, you can see that the normal controls have relatively low synuclein in the blood and Parkinson's has more. If you look at Parkinson's Honinyar stage one, two, three, four, you can see the synuclein increases as the Parkinson's becomes more severe. If you look at the cognition, normal controls, PD normals, PDMCI, PD dementia, it also seems to increase, right? So it's giving us a measure of severity of the Parkinson's. And so we can combine biomarkers of Alzheimer's disease and biomarkers of Parkinson's disease. And from a single blood drawer, we can start to do differential diagnosis, right? So I can tell just from your blood profiles in a research project, um, which disease people have, whether they're truly, truly healthy controls, or do they have Alzheimer changes, Parkinson changes, or both? All right, treatment options in the last couple of minutes. Um, there aren't a lot that are on label, right? So rivastigmine or Exelon patch is approved for the treatment of Parkinson's disease dementia in the United States. There is no approved treatment for dementia with Lewy bodies. So we borrow medicines from lots of different fields to manage all the symptoms, okay? <clears throat> so I would say um, our first approach for most symptoms is a non-pharmacological approach. So if we don't need to use a medicine, we don't prescribe a medicine. But if we need to use a medicine, then we wanna to try to prescribe the best medicine we can at the lowest effective dose, okay? Remember, I'm talking as a cognitive neurologist now, not as the movement disorder neurologist. And that's important, right? because the medicines that the movement disorder neurologists have to use to try to control the motor symptoms tend to make the behavioral symptoms worse, the cognitive symptoms worse, and the blood pressure problems worse. So there's always a delicate balance, right? So as the disease progresses, they face a challenge trying to control the motor symptoms. And I face a challenge trying to co-manage the cognitive and behavioral symptoms. Likewise, the medicines for the cognition can make the motor symptoms worse. The medicines for the behavior can make the motor symptoms worse. So that's why, we, that's why many people at times you'll see one or more neurologists because we're trying to co-manage a problem, okay? It, it's real challenging. There are a lot of trials that have been ongoing. This is slides a little bit old, but it kind of gives the picture. And the picture is that for the most part, the trials have all been negative. So we don't have a lot of good evidence of new medicines, but there's lots of trials that are ongoing, both in Parkinson's disease, dementia, and in dementia with Lewy bodies that hopefully will give us a, a solution to this big problem. So to tie this all up, the Lewy body dementias are a common cause of impairment. Parkinson's disease, dementia, and dementia with Lewy bodies differ only by the timing of the movement disorder. 
Parkinson's disease dementia, the movement sort of has to come first, and then the dementia. Dementia with Lewy bodies is anything else, okay? The criteria are highly specific. So if I make a diagnosis, I'm probably gonna be right. And those criteria correlate strongly with the changes that are occurring in the brain. There are no approved treatments for DLB, and there's only one approved treatment for PDD. So there's a large unmet need, and we use mostly off-label symptomatic approaches that vary from person to person. So if you've seen one person, then you've seen one person because everybody's unique and different and our approach to treating each person is unique and different. So we at the University of Miami, my colleagues in the movement disorder division, us in the cognitive disorder division, people in the sleep division, the whole department, the department of psychiatry, the basic science departments, we're all working to improve clinical practice, improve our ability to make early diagnoses, to improve the lives of our patients and their family caregivers and develop and test new medications. I wanna thank you for your attention.